try to be very prompt today with everything because we have a couple of um, wonderful presentations this morning that we want to make time for as well as communion. So this morning we're going to minimize announcements and probably actually just do the Lord's Prayer together. And you can, in chat, you can send me if you have any prayer requests. And we're going to do a communal prayer after um, the interview and Tony's presentation when we think about the upcoming week and what our hopes will be for it. So that being said, I know that we do have at least one announcement Kit's going to share with us. So Kit, if you would like to share about Angel's sure. Yes. Um, as you know, this has been a tough year for a lot of families in the Valley. And the mission committee met on Friday, and we have decided that we'd like to sponsor a family through Angels and Elves. Uh, Linda and I went down yesterday and put up the small giving tree, and it has all kinds of gift tags on it with the name of the child and the age and what they need or want. Our family has three girls, 10, 8, and 5. So if you're interested in, and would like to go down and take a tag, there's a sign up sheet if you'd write what you're taking so we don't duplicate it. And then buy the item, uh, bring it back and leave it in the coat closet, the small um, closet on the side of the entrance and put your tag on the item. The items will not be wrapped this year. So just bring the item back. And um, we need to have them back by November 29th. Um, so we really appreciate anything you can do to help us with this family. There will be, just so you know, we will have in December um, heifer cards and Zimbabwe cards out there as well. But we'll give you more information about that later. But um, we just wanted you to have enough time if you were interested to buy the gift and return it and we thank you and their announcements for the life of the church not prayer request announcements um, this would be the time and I do want to acknowledge this morning that we um, have the contributions of Alan Labrie the choir met this morning and they're rehearsing for Christmas. Billy was with them and he just completed the um, compilation of the children's music, which we will also be using this month. And we have as guests today, David and Ginger um, agreed to do an interview with us, which we're going to be listening to. And Tony prepared a presentation as well. So we appreciate the gifts of our community to help us reflect as we prepare to be political this week, um, whatever that may mean to us. And, and the, the reflection is about the fact that our faith is not separate from our regular everyday economic, political, social lives. And so we appreciate their presence and their contributions to this service. Alan, if you would give us just a moment of centering music we're going to ask everyone to center themselves and be quiet and just appreciate this music So we're going to move very directly into prayers this morning. And as I said, we are going to 
do a communal prayer at the end of the service as opposed to the beginning, just in the interest of time. So I'm going to invite all of you together to join me in the Lord's Prayer. And you know how this goes. We would love to have you unmute. And, and the words can be up on your screen. But let's, um, let's say this together. <coughs> Our Father, Father who, who art in heaven, in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. Thy will be done. As it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins. As we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. And we do want to acknowledge that uh, David and Ginger are joining us on their 40th anniversary. So uh, feel free to stay unmuted for a minute and go, yay! <laughs> yay! Happy, Happy anniversary. anniversary. Happy anniversary. Happy 40th anniversary. And oh. they're, they're doing Happy the Happy anniversary. <laughs> that is beautiful. And, mm -hmm. and now we're going to ask everybody to mute again. And I do have a request for prayers for Kate's son and wife that God will bless them with pregnancy this winter. Um, we, will, we will have, um, as I say, communal prayers. But if there's anything you want us to say out loud during the um, prayer part of the service later, send it by chat and I will be, do my best to try to include all of those. We're going to move directly then into reading of the scripture. There are three framing scriptures for today. These are drawn particularly in reference to the acknowledgement of participating in civic life, both in the Gospel of Matthew and then in two letters from Paul. I want to clarify that while these texts encourage you to partake of the life of of being a citizen and cooperating and using your voice, and that's what we're going to talk about today, your voice and your vote. We also acknowledge that in the life of Christ, it became necessary that he would try to sort of overturn the social norms of his day, and that along the way, his ministry and his life led him to be in conflict with the governing um, empire of Rome. And his life ended in a political death. And so these texts don't tell you to permit oppressive and unjust governments to continue, but they do ask that when it's possible to use your civic rights in this democracy to participate in meaningful change and explore that choice first and always. So let us begin with these readings. From Matthew 22. Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. And if you're on Zoom, you can see a picture of what that looks like. Then he said to them, whose head is this and whose title? They answered the emperors. Then he said to them, give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperors and to God the things that are God's. And a reading from Romans 13. And you will see that we're going to refer to these passages in the interview with David and Ginger. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities. Therefore, one must be subject because of conscience. Pay to all what is due them. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Revenue to whom revenue is due. Respect to whom respect is due. Honor to whom honor is due. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. And finally, a passage from Timothy. 
First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. So ends the reading. And with that, I'm going to move us into the wonderful treat of an interview with David and Ginger and their thoughts about voting as an act of faith. Uh, we had a long conversation. These, these are excerpts from that conversation, but you'll get both um, their interview and then a prayer later on. This, this now, this is why you said okay to listen. Okay, and we're gonna ask everybody to mute <laughs> so that we're only listening to um, the interview. All right, and you can go ahead with that, we hope. So yeah, switching to again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna formally just say that this is a conversation preceding our national election and we are focused on voting as an act of faith with some really significant reflections that both David and Ginger can bring to us today. And so we appreciate your time and your observations and whatever you have to share with us about the importance of what is coming for us as a nation, for us as individual citizens. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, I guess I'll start off. Um, we've spent uh, 42 years in the military. This is our 25th move coming here to Jackson. Uh, so a, a very different kind of experience from voting from a lot of people. Um, I immediately after graduating high school went to West Point so I had always voted absentee ballot until we moved here to Jackson. Uh, so I guess two years ago when we had, when it was the first uh, election time when we could vote, um, I remember going down and, and getting in line and, you know, they sign your name off, your address. And it was the first time in my life so I, uh, that I had ever voted in person in my life. And it was really, just here in little old Jackson, it was really a significant kind of uh, epiphany as to how important that was and a big deal when I colored in the names and all that, that it really mattered. And in fact, Ginger and I both volunteered uh, to work that election because it's the first election we'd ever been able to take part in personally. And I was one of the people at the end uh, doing the counting. Um, and I think Ginger was working the rosters. Jackson has a special significance in our uh, life as a citizen. It's the first time we voted in person. So we um, hold that as a responsibility that we owe uh, to our community. Your thoughts? Well, I know when, when we got there and we um, pledged that we were accountable for um, helping with the election, I just got tears in my eyes just because, I mean, I was thinking of my family that um, came from Russia, that they never had the opportunity to vote there, um, and just what a privilege it is mm -hmm. um, in this country, and I think sometimes people take it for granted, um, but I did feel the weight of responsibility, and I know I'm going to be helping out this year, and again, I just know I'm going to get teary-eyed when I do that. Um, helping in the in the polls, we get sworn in that day, right? I mean, that promise every time we come to work the polls. So, yeah, yeah even that. And that's one of many oaths you've taken in your life, David. <laughs> yes. Uh, so it um, it is significant because, and, and I have given the oath to thousands of people to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. And now one was being given to me in Jackson. And so I have given the oath and I expect those taking it to take it very seriously. Unfortunately, some have paid the ultimate uh, price for that. And so I equally took it uh, as a very heavy responsibility, though a um, honor, yeah. you know, not a burden I didn't want to bear. The desire or the responsibility or 
for the requirement to vote was putting was put into me actually by my father um old new hampshire yankee born and bred here and he was a school teacher high school teacher uh, so civics were a big part of his life and when we would be traveling all around the world uh, they lived in Keene, so we were registered to vote in Keene, new hampshire he would go down he also would volunteer at the polls but he would go down get the absentee ballot it was, and I remember Keene Ward 5, Hi. Ward 5, I remember this day, all over the world, and he would get it, and, and we would, you know, he'd mail it off to the Army Post Office in Germany, where we were during the Cold War, and we'd fill it out, and you'd have to mail it back, and, and he, he just, that was one of the points he instilled uh, in us as kids. To this day, I never knew how he voted, he just, he never talked about it, he didn't push a political view or party or anything like this, and I have no idea how he ever voted. It, to him, it was important that you vote. So just the act of showing up, which as you reflected, Ginger, I mean, what a privilege when you, your family has stories about not having had a voice in government. And here, that right has been given to you as the descendants of immigrants to be able, and not only the right, but, you know, I think what we're talking about today is the responsibility that everybody feels involved and cares enough to show up in whatever way they can show up, whether it's by voting absentee or whether you are working the polls or just coming to the polls or however you're doing it, right? Just the showing up. Two, two big frameworks that have governed me in my life is uh, being a Christian and uh, being a citizen of the United States. And there are responsibilities and requirements for both of them. And I think voting, uh, is very much a part of both of them. Right? I know. But, uh, you know, the last couple of weeks on Friday afternoons during our Christian conversation and cocktails, uh, we've been uh, following the journey of Paul and the letter. We were talking last night even in Romans. And he was a big advocate for uh, fulfilling your civic responsibility as being part of a Christian. Uh, he said, you know, you have to uh, honor the leaders and institutions. And I, I see voting as an institution and pay taxes and give revenue to who revenues do, give honor to honors do, give respect to who respect is due. And so from his point of view, he was really articulating this, um, you know, kind of contract between the citizen, the Christian citizen and their government. Uh, the government is supposed to provide safety and stability. And then the person has to participate whatever government, he wasn't advocating for a specific government, but whatever the requirements of being a citizen in that are, you owe uh, that level of input as well. And so I think it is a it is a big part, I believe, uh, of being a Christian as well. You know, and that echoes also the gospels, which say render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God under the things that are God's. And yet, I think what you're saying, David, is that they're not separate. We have a religious life, we have a political life, and yet, Christ lived in political times, right? And those who followed him, those that he was working for and with, lived in very tumultuous political times. And his life was fully political. He he died a political death at the hands of the Roman government. So uh, that saying to me, I think in the way that you're saying it is, is to to give our time and our attention to our responsibilities in all places and that we do give to God, but God asks us to be active in the world on behalf of Christ and, and to have political awareness along with everything else. Again, um, Paul's letters and others, what they really do, they seem to um, discuss how you go about doing that, treat love everybody, treat people, my words, dignity and respect, et cetera, like that. In other words, participate in it, but do it in a way that would bring honor to the Christian faith and, and for people to look at you and say, you know, I would like to conduct my life, maybe not make all the decisions they make, yeah. but conduct yeah. myself in the manner that that person's conducting themselves. So he doesn't specify specifically what political position to take or or right. what to do if you're in the congress whatever what he says is he discusses how you interact with people and how you treat the broader community and the ultimate filter is love right i mean it's love right. not just for yourself but for your neighbor and what does that love look like when for you um 
living out your values as a person of faith in ways that are emulating and following in the footsteps of the way that Christ walked, right? Yeah. Uh, The greatest privilege you can have, uh, I think, is being an American, a citizen of the United States. We are not perfect, but I'll tell you, uh, the greatest privilege you have as an American is to vote. The votes all count the same. And that is, you know, like Ginger said, um, uh, her family more recently came uh, to the United States uh, through Ellis Island and immigration from a place where um, you could not vote. Um, Sometimes it is important to reflect back that things weren't always this way and and to appreciate the small things in life. And has been said many times, Americans take many things for granted that other people fight for. And if you if you can think back on the history, not only of this country, but the history of humankind, it does put things in perspective. Um, and one of my tours in Iraq, and I was a director of strategic effects, and one of them was I um, was a senior military person as we were running the first provincial elections ever mm-hmm. in Iraq. And um, many things we were trying to work through and um, one of them is security. Uh, now here in the U.S., when we think of security, it's uh, make sure the mail gets through, so the ballots are counted, make sure we don't lose any ballots, you know, make sure people are registered and you check them off. And, and we think that's a big security challenge. Uh, mine was a different order of magnitude. Mm. Uh, our security problem was literally how do we secure people so they are not killed when they are voting? because this was the first uh, provincial elections and there were many elements within Iraq and the Mideast that did not want democracy to get a foothold. They did not want the citizens to have a voice because for thousands of years, um, they didn't have a voice and and the the people that held on to power didn't want to let that go. And then you had the extremists from Al Qaeda, ISIS or whatever. And so, physical security of the polling places was a big challenge. Now here, there are discussions about voter suppression, which I think is abhorrent. And anybody that tries to prevent you from voting, it's almost the biggest slap in the face to the US Constitution. I, my experience in voter suppression, a little bit different definition of it, is um, the polling places, people it, were very, energized to vote so they would get in line and wait for hours like you're seeing now with early voting which always does my heart good but i see people yeah. stay like, not that i want people to stay in line but i'm like okay that that's a level of commitment yeah. um and what would happen is the extremists would come up with a car bomb and they would drive into the line of people voting and blow up the car bomb to kill them in an effort not just to take away the votes of those people but to dissuade anybody else like if you come vote this is what happened to you. And I I think there's a picture you can put up now okay. uh, of a uh, polling place in Baghdad uh, on election day that was attacked uh, by a, what we call VBID, vehicle borne uh, explosive device. Mm-hmm. And about 65 people were killed. Very unfortunate and very um, attention getting how serious they were to suppress the vote. Yeah. The remarkable thing is within hours, and you can see the picture as it is here, within hours that was cleaned up, polling place was reopened, we put up more barriers, and the line had reformed and people were getting back in line to vote. I have so spent time with people that that are willing to overcome that. Yeah. Because voting is so important to them because they've never done it before in their life. Yeah. And the last picture uh, I think you have, you can put it up, is um from day one in the Iraqi election, it, everybody had the vote of right. I mean, male, female. So, you know, in our country, we've gone mm-hmm. through an iteration of that. But from the very beginning, uh, both uh, male and female uh, citizens of Iraq have voted. And there's a picture, obviously, of a female Iraqi here. And this another part of our security thing was how do we prevent voter fraud so you don't have multiple mm-hmm. votes and all that. And, of course, we didn't have sophisticated electronic voting machines on that. So working with the UN Voting Commission, uh, we came up with this this indelible ink. And when you go into the polling place, you stick your finger in the ink 
and then you vote. And then if you have that ink on your finger, which is very difficult to get off, it <laughs> says you've already voted. So necessity is a mother invention that worked very well. Well, we meant it just as a way to make sure people didn't vote more than once. It became spontaneously a badge of honor Wow. For everybody in Iraq, and you see this picture, you know, they're holding up their finger saying, see, we finally got the chance to vote. See, we're finally empowering our people. And we didn't think it was going to become that, but it, it spontaneously okay. became that. And it, when I would see the Iraqis going around it, and that it lasts for days, you can never get it off. <laughs> and I was working with the officials and we were working through the administrative part of it. The first thing they would do when they walk in the room and see me is to hold up the finger just as a badge of honor. See, I did it. I, you know, I thwarted the extremists. I went and voted. And it was also a way for those of us that were serving at the time for them to thank us. Mm. Uh, kind of the politics of, you know, geopolitical issues in the Mideast. But we obviously had a lot of American servicemen and women there. And they credited us with giving them the chance to vote. So it was, a, they would put... The, their finger up to us as they would see us and, and say, thank you. You know, thank you that I got to vote for the first time in my life. So that also having gone through that experience has given me a new appreciation for something that I'm sure I took for, uh, you know, granted. And when my father would send the ballots, I'm like, oh. I didn't see it quite as a responsibility until after I'd had that experience in Iraq. Mm -hmm. So that really changed the perspective. It did. It did. Well, I think because I'm, because I work the polls, so I do absentee, so I make sure it does get in. But I know when I got there the last time, it was the coveted I voted sticker. Yes. I kept like looking over there and you know, I was really busy with everybody, but I really wanted one of the stickers. <laughs> so I think this next time after I'm sworn in, I'm gonna make sure I get one of my stickers. So it's the same thing as- you know, As the I triple voted. finger salute, right? You know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny, I've, I've been thinking about, did I want to vote ahead of time because I'm working the day of the election, or do I want to, and I felt like I there is something vote. about, right, that I voted sticker, I'm like, ooh, I want that, and I, I want to, since I can, I want to do it on the day of, but um, I'm guessing your, your children, or at least your daughter and son-in-law are having to vote absentee because they are uh, serving abroad, is that accurate? That's correct. Yeah, they're in Italy, and so they have to. Um, they're both in the army, so they vote absentee uh, from there to send it back here. So um, they're going through the process that, that we went through. I mean, I it just became. I didn't even give a second thought. I'm like, okay, it's voting time. Dad's going to send me the absentee ballot. I mean, um, it, it wasn't. And of course, it'd been registered since uh, you know I left high school in there. So I never even you know I was registered. And once you register for life. It, I mean, unless you move, the yeah. absentee. So actually, it wasn't until we got to Jackson, you know, and I'm here I am 60 years old. I'm like, well, how do I register to vote? You know, I mean, I've been registering key for 50 years. So if you had to start from scratch, how do we register to vote? You know, how do we get on the rolls? You know, and, and how, you know, where do you vote in Jackson? Half of it was and, new and, for um, you guys. Then. It was, right. yeah. I mean, it's so, it was, um, and so like you, kind of going through the thing, like, well, we could vote early, but I'm like, no, nah, I it's become sort of the excitement of the day. I'm going down on election day, you know, if, if the Iraqis I worked with can deal with people being killed in front of them, I can make it down to the bottom of the hill on election day and, yeah. and get my I voted sticker. <laughs> um, my daughter. I think you've, I think you've done a really great job of framing why this is an act of faith, but our the day after election day or the day after the results are finalized, about half the people are not gonna be happy with the outcome. I mean, just if you look at the polls, about half the people, no matter how things go, are, are probably not going to be satisfied with the outcome. My advice would be, as part of your responsibility, I think both as a Christian and a citizen is, okay, that is one event, and it's one input you have as a citizen to this country. So. If, if things don't turn out the way you want, you know, don't go burn down J-Town Deli to the ground or tear down the covered bridge or paint graffiti on the Jackson Library. Get involved, okay? Next time, put out more yard signs or get involved in uh, local civic organizations or try, there are so many ways to exert influence in our country other than, other than just voting. Voting's a big one, probably the biggest privilege, but there are so many other ways to make a difference that don't just give up. 
well, it didn't work out the way I wanted, so I'm going to vent my frustration in a destructive manner. No, focus your activity in a constructive manner. And there are so many things that can be done that um, you've got to keep the whole thing in perspective. Yeah, I, I hear that. And um, there was a thought that went in my head and went out of my head as you were sharing that. One thing, Gail, remember last night we were talking about, I mean, in years to come, when we look back at our actions, how are we going to you know, feel about that? You know, did we act in a Christian manner and that we will still feel proud of how we how we acted and react. Remember that we belong to each other before and after the day of the election and through all the waiting for the results and through the what we pray will be a peaceful transition of power. And for whatever that outcome may be that we are still a nation who is stronger, one made out of many, right? E pluribus unum. The, uh, again, going back to Paul's letters and others that how we're charged to be in in some ways simultaneously and, and I don't think there's a um that you have to choose one or the other you know a Christian and a member of society and responsibility because it's as we take care of others uh mm-hmm. of which government is supposed to provide that safety and, and security for folks uh it's it's a daily occurrence really so it, um, it's great to be able to go and vote, but I think people should realize that should not just be the end of what you do, especially in this great country to, you know, repay the, the debt I think all citizens have uh, to their community, local community, Jackson, New Hampshire, mm-hmm. uh, the country, because we are very in, in you know, uh, government, especially a representative or democratically elected republic like we have. It, it, it's constantly evolving and changing based upon the activity of people. Yeah, it's an you know, act of faith. I would say it's an act of faith and it's a uh, responsibility of our faith. And it's outlined multiple times in the Bible. So it's not um, it, it's not just an act of faith. Some people say, well, I'm just going to vote. And then whatever happens, it's in God's hands. Well, God works through us. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we are his uh, worker bees down here. So it's, it's a responsibility, um, that we need to fulfill as part of our faith. So as I said, this was a very brief excerpt from a conversation and um, full disclosure, I had a completed version of it and then it went haywire and I had to redo the entire editing thing. So you see a few more blips in this one than probably the original one had, but hey, you know, we, we, we produced it twice and thank you, David and Ginger, for your great thoughts and your humor um, and just reminding us about what's at stake and what people do in other parts of the world to have the same privilege that we do sometimes take for granted. Let us not take for granted the use of our voice and our vote this week. Tony prepared an essay or a presentation for us and we're going to hear that now and then we're gonna close out with um, prayer and communion. So, um, and the words for Tony's presentation are on the screen. So, as he reads along, Tony, are you ready? You have to unmute yourself, Tony, so we can start to hear you. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, good. Uh, <clears throat> as I reflected upon what I wanted to say this morning, I decided to begin at the beginning and make it relevant to the issues we are grappling with today. While at the same time, emphasizing my belief in the separation of church and state. With this principle in mind, I selected two separate texts, which when combined together 
are both pertinent and timely. One is drawn from a religious source, the Bible. The other comes directly from the state. It is the Constitution of the United States of America. The first reading is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was made God and dwelt among us. All things were made by God. Without God, there was nothing. In due time, we as human beings made something by enacting the Constitution of the United States of America. It was the first document of its kind ratified by the representatives of the people to serve as the supreme law of the land. The second reading is from the preamble to that document. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. Today, as we join together, stand together on the threshold of making history on Tuesday, we need to invoke the wisdom of these words. Let our conscience be our guide and reaffirm our commitment to endorse a government that is of, by, and for the people. In so doing, we will proudly acknowledge our membership in a community that bears witness to the truth and the truthful transmission of our beliefs and values to our heirs and successors. In keeping with these values, we need to ensure that the laws and mores governing our society remain rooted in humanistic values and reflect our highest ideals and aspirations. To achieve these lofty goals, we must recognize that the essence of any society is determined by its moral compass and its code of ethics. These are the two pillars of society that enable us to distinguish between right and wrong, good and evil, and highlight the ways in which we care for one another. In today's world, our identity and character are manifested in a number of different ways, not least of which are one, contributing to the perpetuation of our civic virtues. Two, a willingness to do our duty and assume our responsibilities as citizens of this Republic to preserve, in the words of John Adams, a government of laws, not of men and women. And three, a commitment to honor our obligations as the custodians of our legacy and heritage. With these thoughts in mind, we need to seize this moment and create a legacy of which we can be proud to pass on to our children and grandchildren. In so doing, we will also fulfill our role as the architects of a future that speaks to the needs and expectations of generations of young people 
who will follow in our footsteps. And why, while we must always first and foremost stand ready to protect and defend the interests of the United States, both at home and abroad, we should never lose sight of our aspirational goals to combat all forms of oppression, battle against bigotry and intolerance, and fight as we did for the principles of freedom and independence during the American Revolution. If we really want to aim high, maybe we should expand upon the golden rule to do unto others as you would have others do unto you, or stated differently, love thy neighbor as thyself. In brief, we should recommit ourselves to a more perfect union between our personal faith and the sacred principles of liberty and justice for all. Fortunately, we are blessed and privileged as a country and a nation because we have an opportunity to participate in the political process and make our voices heard. On Tuesday, as you literally pull the curtain behind you to cast your vote, you can take pride in the fact that we as Americans have been doing it longer and better than any other country in the history of humankind. That's also the moment when you need to stop, reflect upon the current state of affairs, and appraise that you and I and all of us do what is best for our country and the world and ensure in the immortal words of Lincoln's Gettysburg Address that this government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. In closing, I want to share a thought with you which has always provided me with renewed confidence and a sense of political purpose when I worry about the fate of our nation and our inability to define ourselves as a people. The process unfolds when I, when I see through a glass dimly, then brightly, and realize that no one person, no one group has a monopoly on America. It's my country too, and it's yours as well. On this Sunday in particular, I ask for one and one thing only. May God bless America. Uh, so if you guys want to come and just kind of give a moment of appreciation for both David and Ginger's contributions and Tony's thoughts. Um, these were much work done. Wonderful, wonderful both. Yeah. Thank you. Lots to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. And there's some of that happening here in the sanctuary too. Some nods, some, some applause. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, 
I want to move us now into our prayers of the people because we've heard from a few folks about the significance of the milestones that are coming towards us. Also, the reality that we will be a nation together on the other side of Tuesday, on the other side of whatever the elections bring to us when we know the outcome of it. And as I've said a few times, um, we, we still belong to each other before and after. And within those parameters and without getting into politics, what are your hopes for this, for this week and this time that's coming? Um, I've certainly heard at the eight o'clock requests for peace, for peaceful transition of power, um, and that we will remember that we're still the same community and that we'll find ways to continue to work together. If you do have any other prayer that you want to lift up, you're welcome to unmute yourself in Zoom. Is there anybody that wants to add a prayer? Uh, Wendy and Kevin here, and I'm going to, we did have a couple people put things into chat too, so we have prayers for the nation, then we have personal prayers again. Kate's prayer for her son and his wife, that they will be blessed with pregnancy. We have a friend who's in Rotary named Bob Gravino, who himself is a veteran, and we're praying for his well-being and his health. Um, Kevin has a prayer. Kevin's got a list here for us. I have to write it down. Ministers for Antonella, who's traveling right now, um, for, for Jeanette and Sue for their healing. And also, we're going to add Judy Botsford to that because she just underwent hip surgery and she's just home recovering. And we have other people as we know, with ongoing health issues around cancer um, who are being treated in multiple stages of that or are in recovery from it. And so, you know, hearts and prayers for those. Wendy, did you have your hand up for anything? No, Joyce? Okay. Um, Alan asked for continued prayers for Father Steve and for Our Lady of the Mountains as they're undergoing you know, missing his leadership. And presumably, there's two screenfuls full of you guys. So again, you're going to have to unmute and jump in if you want to add anything to what we've already shared today. Otherwise, I'm going to ask you to be in prayer. And then we're going to close out with the prayer that David gave us for um, to, to go with the interview that we just heard. Please join me in prayer. O oh, holy God, this morning we place our lives into your keeping and our nation into your keeping. We go with trust to perform our civic duties, some of us volunteering, some of us helping give rides, some of us casting our vote. Others have already done this in advance. We ask for wisdom for our leaders, just as we were asked in the letter to Timothy to pray for those who govern for those who represent us, and yet in this democracy, our voices count. And so we ask that our voices will be heard and that we will still be a nation that can find its common ground and its sense of unity, its strength, even though we are many and diverse and gifted in our strengths that we will find our sense of nationhood and community together. We ask for healing all over the world, healing from wildfires and hurricanes and floods, warfare. We think of the Chikanga church in the city of Mutare. We think of the villages in Honduras. 
We think of the places where our children serve, David and Ginger's children in Italy and our children in so many parts of the world and parts of this country, our far-flung families. We pray for healing of our bodies, bodies with damaged nerves and spinal cords and healthy cells and unhealthy cells and minds that work differently now. May we be held with dignity and peace and healing where it's possible. Amen. And I would ask now that you would um, lend your ear to David's prayer. Okay. Um, I would ask God uh, to give us wisdom as we go into our little voting booth or, or down here. Jackson is just like a little table, I guess. You fill out. Uh, give us wisdom to uh, vote uh, for the kind of uh, people that um, will uh, discharge our duties. Uh, in a way that uh, is in accordance uh, with our ethics and morals um, and that, uh, you know, that we, we are guided and motivated not only to vote, but think think through the consequences of it and, and, and maybe give us uh, the energy to, to go in as an informed voter and to understand the policies. I mean, you, nobody could understand the intricacies of every budgetary items and all that, but, but you know, be somewhat of an informed voter. Uh, uh, a prayer of thanks that we can walk in and not worry about our physical safety and that um, it, 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 is, it is almost by second nature we do that and that it's taken hundreds of years for our nation to get where we are. 100% um, of our citizens can vote, et cetera, like that, that, you know, we have fought civil wars and suffragette movements and everything like that for people to get where they are. So th th it should not be taken lightly that this um, right to vote has not arrived where we are without significant sacrifice uh, uh, by thousands of people before us. And then the last prayer, and as you alluded to, Gail, would be for God uh, to give us the... Um, uh, sort of the inner peace to accept the outcomes, whatever they are. And many times in the Bible, uh, we are directed to pray for our leaders. So whoever is um, officially elected our leaders, that we have the discipline, whether it's who we voted for or not, that we have the discipline to pray for them, for them to be successful, because being successful means being successful to us. And the last thing is, as you said, e pluribus unum, um, elections should not be a time to drive a wedge between people. You, you can honorably disagree with some policy issue or tax rate issue or who knows what the issues are on the ballot. That, that doesn't have to come at all between people on your personal relationships. And I think, uh, again, in the Bible, it, it says you, you conduct your um, civic responsibility duty, but you do it in a way, giving dignity and respect, treating people with love, et cetera. It's, um, I would pray that after all of this, in a way it brings people back together because that has always been the strength of our nation. Uh, and it's, it's always the strength uh, articulated in the Bible, that coming together and acting as one, that that's where the strength of a community, of a church is, of a family. Mm. Thank you. Um, do you okay, so that's a lot about our civic duty. And um, we thank you. Now we turn to the act that brings us together to the same table regardless of where we began. And that is communion. This morning, wherever you are, May you have your elements, uh, what you will use for your juice or your beverage and for your bread, cracker, cookie, whatever you have that you can eat and share with us together. 
And here in the church, we have, I think I've shown you before, these cute little disposable things. Everybody's got their own, and it's safe. So that's how we're doing this. So let us begin by sharing in the Sursum Corda and Sanctus, which you'll find on your screen. And we would invite you all to unmute and to read along with us. God be with you. And, and also with you. you. Lift up your hearts. We lift, we lift, lift them up them your hearts high. Let us give thanks to God most high. It, it is, is right. right. It is very neat, right, and our bounden duty that we should at all times and in all places give thanks unto you, everlasting God. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing together, and singing can happen out there, muted, and in here it's all going to be humming, holy, 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 but you'll be able to hear it, I think. So here we go. God Almighty, early in the morning, our song joins. <laughs> Lord God Almighty, early in the morning, our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. And we do have some people humming along, which is awesome. We actually had music here in the sanctuary because we had some people humming. I'm recruiting them for the choir very soon now. <laughs> and now we come to the time when we will bless the elements that you are all sharing together. We ask, O oh Holy God, that you will be present to us, present to us in your brokenness, in the pouring out of your own life, that we may become your body of Christ, your members of your church, your children, your brothers, your sisters, and that we will remember this, that love is the greatest of all transforming forces and powers. And we have been given love and we are called to become that walking love in the world. And today at this table, may we taste of that transforming love. And so on the night that Christ sat with his beloved friends, he took the bread that was on the table and he broke it. And he said, when you take a bite of the bread, do so in remembrance of this love that changes everything. And so now, brothers and sisters, take, eat, and do so in remembrance of love. brothers and sisters, in the same way, Christ poured out the wine and shared the cup with those with whom he sat as he faced a government that he knew would be coming to arrest him and take him away. And he knew his life was in danger. And in fact, his life became forfeit. But the great part of this story is that death is not the ending. Death is not the final story. That there is a life and a love that flows beyond that death and brings us all back into the presence of the greatest love. And so today, brothers and sisters, when we drink, we do so in remembrance of that great love.
will post to the screen the statement of thanksgiving, and I invite all of you to join once more in that statement of thanksgiving. We are not alone. God made us. We are not, we are not alone. alone. We have each, each other. Can anything separate us from the love of Christ? Can Can the 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 no, in all these things, we win an overwhelming victory through the one whose love for us has been proven. It can be. Neither death, it's nor it's life, it's neither messenger of heaven, heaven, nor ruler it's on it's earth, it's neither what happens it's today, it's nor what may it's happen it's tomorrow. It's neither power from on high, nor power, from high, from high power from below, or, from below. or anything else or anything has, has power to separate us from the love of God. Of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen. So now is that tradition when if you're at your house, you get to sing the benediction. And if you're here, you get to hum the benediction behind your mask <laughs> so that we're all Sing safe. in church. All right. So at church, you have to hum behind your mask. Everywhere else, you can um, sing out loud, maybe muted. Okay. Um. first day of November. Obviously, you all successfully made the transition with the daylight savings time, because here you are. And this month, we, were going, we are going to focus on gratitude. You will be receiving um, a link to a PDF from the church, but anybody that needs it printed, we will print it for you, with a daily thought about gratitude. And this is an incredibly important spiritual practice which especially for a month that has a lot of challenges ahead for all of us, may help us be resilient and hopeful and reframe when things are feeling hard. So look for that with a daily thought on gratitude for your, your own spiritual fulfillment and nourishment. Go. And now Alan is going to give us a brief transitional thing, and then you can all chat for a little bit.